So in the last video, I came up with a pretty ridiculous example to try to impress upon you the mind-blowing power of pentation, our fifth hyperoperation. We took, we did pentation with a four and a two, and we saw that what yielded from that was so ridiculously big that really we had a hard time tying it to anything in physical reality. But there's no reason we have to stop, right? We did with a four and a two. What about four and a three, right? I mean, two is close to three. So how much worse can pentation with a four and a three be than pentation with a four and a two? Well, let me show you. If we did pentation with a four and a three, which we can write in Rucker's notation this way or Newt's up arrow notation this way. Well, let's see. A four and a three here is telling me I want to do repeated tetration. I want to use fours in my tetration. However, I want there to be three of them. So it would look kind of like this. But remember that if you just look up here, this four with the four up here is tetration with two fours. This four and this four up here represent that number we were talking about in the last slide, that pen clicking number. So if we talk about a four with a little three here, that's the same as a four with that pen clicking number up here. Wait, what's that even mean? What that means is that we would have an exponent tower of fours and the height of that exponent tower would be the value of that pen clicking number that I talked about in the last video. That's pretty amazing. That's hard to even wrap your head around. To be clear, the height of this new tower is not the number of pen clicks. The height of this new tower is the value of that number that our computer couldn't even write with all those pen clicks. That's the height of this new tower. If we did pentation with a four and a three, we would get something that is so absurdly large, you couldn't even fathom writing it in any standard notation. The best you can do without hyper operations is write it as an exponent tower. But the problem is the height of that exponent tower would be so big, it would be that crazy number, the value of that crazy number from the previous video. The computer couldn't even finish writing that crazy number. Again, the height of the tower is not the length of the number. It's the size of the number. When we made a similar tower that had height four, four to the fourth to the fourth to the fourth, that was the pen clicking number. If we had a similar, if we had a tower of fours, but instead of its height being four, it was five, it would be insane. There's no way I would, I could run out of examples with all pen clicks and ants and everything else. There's no way I could come up with the physical example. If we had a tower of fours, whose height was five, six, forget about it. No chance, but that's not what we're talking about here. This number would have a height of the value of that pen clicking number. I think the only way to understand this stuff, the only way to really be impressed by this stuff is to try it on your own. See if you can do pentation, our fifth hyper operation with two threes. See if you can write that as an exponent tower because you won't be able to figure out the number, trust me. But can you just write that as an exponent tower and figure out how tall that tower would be? A little hint for you is three to the 27th power is roughly seven trillion. So let's see, how would this work? If I had to do pentation with two threes, this is telling me to do repeated tetration with threes. Oh yeah, how many threes in your tetration? There'll be three of them because of this three. So it would look like this. And remember, we always work from the top down. So first you're gonna look up here at just these two threes. This is asking me to build an exponent tower with threes for this three. Oh yeah, how many threes should be in your exponent tower? Three of them for this three. So these two threes up here turn in three to the third to the third. Three to the third to the third is the same as three to the 27th. And up here I said three to the 27th is roughly seven trillion. So what that's saying is that this number is a three with a number up here that is huge, roughly seven trillion. What I'm saying is pentation with two threes is a tower of threes, an exponent tower of threes. How tall is your exponent tower? It is seven trillion threes tall. What's that even mean? It means that the number is gonna be absurd when we made a tower that had a height of four. Granted, it had fours instead of threes as the number that was repeated, but when it had a height of four, it created that pen click number. Our tower doesn't have a height of four, it has a height of seven trillion. It's worth pointing out that it's 146 kilometers to the sun, give or take. 146 million kilometers is this many centimeters. So if I used a font that was two centimeters tall and I actually wrote this exponent tower, if I actually wrote seven trillion or so of these threes, my exponent tower would reach our sun. So that I can refer to this thing later on, pentation with two threes, this tower of threes that is so tall that if you wrote it with a decent sized font, the tower of exponents would reach the sun. Because I wanna be able to refer to that thing, I'm gonna call that thing a sun tower. 
which kind of makes sense. I didn't make up Sun Tower. I got to give credit to this guy, Tim Urban, who wrote an article on his blog, which is called Wait But Why, that is also on Graham's number that's kind of inspired a lot of this stuff. He called this thing a Sun Tower. I don't need to reinvent the wheel. I think that's a good name for it, so I'm going to call it a Sun Tower as well. Pentation with two threes, our fifth hyper operation, creates a Sun Tower. The value of a Sun Tower, I don't know what to tell you. Way beyond anything we could ever talk about. And that's only our fifth operation. We don't have to stop there. What about our sixth operation? Oh man, this is gonna get bad. Let's see, our sixth operation is called hexation. We got addition, our first, then multiplication, then exponentiation, and then tetration was the first real new one, our fourth one. Then we saw pentation, which is just repeated tetration, which is just repeated exponentiation. What we're gonna add on now is what's called hexation. What hexation is, is repeated pentation. Pentation is insane, it's mind boggling but we're moving right on past it. We're gonna talk about hexation. I need notation for hexation. So what I'm gonna do is instead of just using new up arrow notation, which would be three with four arrows in here, I'm instead gonna use bottom right as an invented notation for hexation. I'm gonna take my three and a three down here. And what this is meant to say is we wanna do hexation with a three and another three. I know that hexation is repeated pentation. So what this is telling me is that I'm gonna use threes in my pentation. Oh yeah, how many of them? Three of them. So it would look like this. Oh man, if I was working on this, I work from kind of the top down, although top down kind of means the bottom up because I've reversed everything because I'm writing the threes as a subscript instead of a superscript. I first got to figure out this three and this three. Well, let's see, this three and this three is pentation with two threes. Pentation with two threes is the same as tetration with three threes. Tetration with three threes, well, I can look at the top two of those threes and write that as an exponent tower. I know that three to the third to the third power, we've already seen that, that's that seven trillion number. So what I need to do is tetration with a three and that seven trillion number. Wait, that sounds familiar. Tetration with a three and that seven trillion number, that's the sun tower. What we're being asked to do here is pentation, but not with two threes. With two threes, pentation created the sun tower. I don't wanna do pentation with two threes. I wanna do pentation with a three and the value of the sun tower. Remember just a few seconds ago when you were overwhelmed by pentation with two threes, when we talked about how that creates a sun tower and we could never even fathom what the value of that sun tower would be? Yeah, we're not doing that anymore. We're not doing a pentation with a three and a three, nor pentation with a three and a four or a three and a five or a three and a six. We're instead gonna do pentation with a three and the value of the sun tower. Pentation with a three and a sun tower, we're gonna call that G1. Wait, what just happened there? The value of the sun tower is the height of a different tower. The height of that new tower has a value. That value determines the height of a different tower. The value of that different tower creates the height of yet another tower, and so on, and so on, and so on. And you're like, wow, that takes a long time. How many times do you have to do that? You have to do that until you get to the sun towereth tower. Wow, that's just ridiculous. If you're not impressed by G1, if, if your mind isn't completely boggled by G1, you are better than I, because this is ridiculous to me. G1, it comes from the sixth operation in the sequence using just threes, and it's nuts. It's completely incomprehensible but we don't have to stop at the sixth operation. We could go to the seventh operation. Or, I mean, if we were crazy, I guess we could go to the billionth operation. In fact, we don't even have to stop at the billionth operation in this sequence. I couldn't even imagine what that could be. We can get bigger than a billion. We could go and figure out the value of that pen click number from before. Or we could figure out the value of a sun tower and we could jump all the way to that operation in the sequence. I think it's time to check back in with old Ronald Graham. Ronald Graham is not impressed. This is not Ronald Graham. This is what came up when I did a Google image search of not impressed is Stanley from the office, but it doesn't matter. It's a good picture of not impressed. Why is Ronald Graham not impressed? Because G1 is not Graham's number. G2 is defined as below. I got to warn you, this is going to be ridiculous. Here's G2. Wait, what is this saying? G2 is created from threes in much the same way that G1 is created from threes. But G2 does not use hexation, the sixth hyper operation in our sequence. It jumps so far into the sequence. How far into the sequence does it jump? It jumps to the G one operation in the sequence. The value of G1 
determines which operation in this infinite sequence of hyper operations we use just to define G2. Wow. I don't even know what to say about that. I mean, the best I can do is say that the value of the sun towereth consecutive sun tower, when we're creating these sun towers from previous sun towers by taking the value of a previous sun tower to create the height of the next sun tower, that value is the number of arrows. All it's doing is telling us the operation that we'd use to create another number. And guess what? G2 isn't Graham's number either. Prepare yourself for this because this is the last slide that I have in this talk. G2 ain't Graham's number. G64 is Graham's number. G64 is created in this iterative process, just like we got G2 from G1 by figuring out the G1 operation in our sequence and using that operation on two threes, we could figure out G3 by using a different operation. Which operation? The G2 operation in our sequence with two threes. And then once we got G3, we can do G4 and then G5 and then G6. And we can continue doing that until we get to G64. We're using an operation so deep in this infinite sequence of hyper operations that I don't even know how to describe it to you other than kind of showing this picture that again came from somebody else's website. This is how Graham's number is calculated. This is G64. I feel like mathematician Ronald Graham needs a shout out. Here's an actual picture of mathematician Ronald Graham. May he rest in peace. Died earlier this year in 2020. There's a really good New York Times obituary about him if you're interested in reading it. Seems like a really good guy. Did lots of really interesting things. World-class juggler. Go figure. Into, into all sorts of stuff. What he said was that a two-colored complete graph on the vertices of a hypercube in Graham's number of dimensions must contain a planar monochromatic K4. Remember the original problem where first we had a cube and we were connecting all of the vertices of a cube with either red or blue edges and the goal was to do so in such a way that we didn't create a planar monochromatic K4? And it was easy enough to show that this can be done in three dimensions, a regular three-dimensional cube, no problem connecting all the vertices and avoiding a planar monochromatic K4. But then the question came up, what about a cube in four dimensions? What about a four-dimensional hypercube or a five-dimensional hypercube or a six-dimensional hypercube? What Ronald Graham showed is that if we had enough dimensions in our hypercube, not four dimensions like a tesseract or five dimensions or six dimensions, but a Graham's number of dimensions in our hypercube, then we would be guaranteed to have a monochromatic planar K4. That no matter how hard you tried connecting the different vertices with red and blue edges, there would have to be one of these different objects. He proved that fact. He used this crazy number that we spent the last 10 minutes deriving, Graham's number, in a mathematical proof. It got into the Guinness Book of World Records as the largest number ever used in a serious mathematical proof. It was the number of dimensions in the hypercube that was guaranteed to contain a planar monochromatic K4. Fun fact, Ronald Graham did not say that if you have a hypercube in less than Graham's number of dimensions, then somebody could color the edges in red and blue and avoid a planar monochromatic K4. He wasn't saying that. He wasn't saying that G64 was the smallest number in which there is guaranteed to be a monochromatic K4. He just said that if you had that many dimensions, then there necessarily would be one. He proved an upper bound on a solution to the question, what is the least number of dimensions that a hypercube could have where we would be guaranteed to have a monochromatic planar K4? He's not telling you what the answer is. He's just saying the answer is less than Graham's number. And when you start to realize the absurd size of Graham's number, you're kind of less impressed that he's just saying that the true answer is some number less than that number. In fact, most mathematicians, most experts in this field suspect that the true answer is not Graham's number or anywhere near Graham's number. Most mathematicians suspect that if you have just six dimensions, in your hypercube, then it must be the case that it would contain a monochromatic planar K4. Nobody can prove that, but most experts in the field suspect it to be true. That's all that I have on Graham's number, so I'll end this here. Thanks for listening to the presentation. If you're interested, I'm gonna post all these slides up on my website. The URL is listed down here.